In this video, we will review the basics of music symbols and notation as it pertains to articulation markings, stylistic markings, and basic notation markings. Today's video is on music notation and modern music symbols. This is not a beginner tutorial on how to read music. This is for the intermediate to advanced level student who is trying to brush up on some of the more advanced symbols or maybe trying to do some easy um, score creation. Again, it's not a beginner tutorial. Let's go ahead and talk about key signatures. Now, key signatures are crucial when writing music or playing music. The reason is because key signatures will play a big role on what particular notes you play um, in a piece. The reason is because key signatures determine how many sharps or flats are in a piece. Now, don't confuse this with accidentals. If you are familiar with accidentals, that's not what this means. Um, this will determine how many sharps or flats are in a key in general. This is the D major key signature, which would mean that F sharps and C sharps are the two sharps. In other words, every time you see the note F and the note C, you're gonna play F sharp and C sharp. Now, looking at time signatures, which follows a key signature, this is of course also crucial. Time signatures will determine what note gets the beat. I also like to think about it as what note gets one beat. Um, another thing that I didn't write here is time signatures will determine how many beats are in a measure, up to how many you will count in a particular measure. If the time signature is 4-4, four, four, then we count up to a 4. Um, so that's very, very, very crucial. For example, like I said, if we have a 4-4 four, four time signature, that top number will tell you that's how many beats are in a measure. The bottom number, like to think about it as a fraction, and will tell you that the quarter note is what equals one. So every time you see a quarter note, you give it one beat. So now let's go ahead and talk about when we're actually doing some, some note writing, some part writing or score writing, what direction do we put those beams in? Um, they, they're not random, they are put specifically in a certain direction. That middle note, that third line can go either up or down. Um, but the notes below the middle note need to actually go upwards. So anything that's below that third line on the staff, those stems are going to be pointing up. Anything that's above that third middle line on the staff will be pointing downwards. Now, what we want to do is determine if that middle note will go up or down and how do we decide that usually it's a pattern thing if the notes that come before the middle note go up then you just want to keep the pattern and want to write it up so if the notes before the middle stem or the middle note go downward then you just want to keep the same pattern and it'll go downward Again, that middle note can go up or down, so it just depends on what's around it. So let's look at another example. If we're going to have some eighth notes and we want to beam them together, um, this would be the logical way of beaming them together. Um, so, of course, we would stem up. Now, we don't want to do anything where we're going to beam a note um, in the opposite way and it's not going to be correct. Now, see, that note's wrong because that bottom note, uh, that second space note, the, be the beam should actually be pointing upward. Um, and we don't want to do anything where the beams are separated. Now, let's go ahead and discuss rests. There are times within a measure that you're going to see this big line kind of looks like a football field goal post. And then it'll have a number on top. That means that that's the amount of rest you're going to have. This is the way it would look within a measure. So if the, if the number on that is a four, then within that measure, you're going to actually have four total measures, um, not just one. 
you're going to have four total ones. Even though it's in the space of one measure, that number tells you that you're going to have four total. So you would have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four of rest. That would be your total counts of rest. Why? Again, because that symbol is telling you that there's no notes in that measure and that they want you to actually have four total measures. Now let's discuss the placements of sharps, flats, and natural signs and where they go next to a note. When you're going to place one of the symbols, accidentals, or sharps, you're going to place it next to the note head. Remember, we talked about stems, and we discussed that the stem is a little stick. That means that the note head is the actual round part of the note, okay? So the, the stem is, is the little stick, and the note head is the little round part of the note. So the note needs to always... Um, the, the, the accidental or the sharp or the flat needs to always be next to the note head all the time, okay? Don't put it behind the stem because then it's actually on the wrong side. For example, this would be inaccurate because this is on the stem side. Even though, yes, it's next to the note head, it's on the stem side. That's not accurate. It always needs to be on the side of the note head. Now, let's look at the differences between a tie and a slur. Um, what are the major differences? How do we determine when it's a tie or a slur? Because if you're familiar with ties and slurs, they look the same. A tie connects the same notes and the slurs connect different notes, okay? It's still the same symbol, the little curve, um, but they are different. And let me show you the difference. A tie would be two of the same notes. If you notice those two notes are both on the first space and they do have the little curve, but that two notes indicates that they are a tie. Now on a slur, notice that one's on a space, one's on a line, clearly two different notes. That's how we would see the difference of a tie and a slur. Usually a tie is to create uh, more time on a specific note. So usually it has to do be a timing or rhythmic issues. Um, a slur is usually for phrasing or for strings for the bowing direction to connect notes. Um, so those are the major differences. Now, let's look at how a slur would affect bowings for string players. For example, we have two slurs here, and if the first slur is on a down bow, that first note and that second note would be on a down bow because that slur connects them. So that means that the next bowing would be up, so both notes would be up bow because that slur connects both of those notes. That is how slurs affect bowings for string players. Now, one of the very important things when writing music is, of course, the use of dynamics. And dynamics is, of course, how soft or loud a particular note or section or phrase is going to be played. Um, this is going to help a piece be more musical. So whether you're writing a piece or whether you're performing a piece, the use of dynamics is, is important to the musicality of the overall performance. So we start with the softest, which is three Ps, then go up to two, one, mezzo piano, mezzo forte, um, the two Fs, and then the three Fs, from softest to loudest, okay? So the F is loud, forte, like in Spanish, fuerte, and the P is piano, and that M stands for mezzo or medium. Mezzo spelled M-E-Z-Z-O. Mezzo or medium. So MP would be medium soft. MF would be medium loud or mezzo forte or mezzo piano. Now, we also have symbols that allow us to get gradually louder or gradually softer. To play gradually louder, we call that crescendo, which... It means that, for example, we're going to go from piano to forte within the time frame of wherever that crescendo is written. So if it's written within two measures, within those two, two measures, we went from piano to forte or over the course of four or five measures, however long that crescendo lasts. Now, the opposite would be to go from forte to piano, for example, and we add the D E before crescendo to spell decrescendo, which is, of course, the opposite 
of it so we would get loud and then get gradually softer so a decrescendo means to gradually decrease volume if we add an sfz that means sforzando that sforzando means that we're going to force the sound or somewhat like an accent s for uh sforzando and of course the f and the z as you can see where they were the word uh, comes from or the, the abbreviation comes from. It's a forced or abrupt note, okay? So you do the note a little bit more aggressive. Now on the flip side, we can have something SP, which the S stands for suddenly. So suddenly piano, the Italian word for it would be subito, subito piano, okay? So suddenly soft. Suddenly soft is that, so you're playing loud or whatever dynamic, you see that and all of a sudden you're suddenly, suddenly soft, which can also be done with a fort. Now, articulation plays a big role in playing the correct style of a piece. Staccato, which is short, is one of the most known articulation styles, so it's to play each note very short. Da, 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 da. Tenuto is depending on the style, but... It could be um, longer or separate. Usually tenuto doesn't have any type of short phrasing. I like to label it as detaché, which I refer to as a detached or separate legato bow stroke. Now we're going to go ahead and look at marcato. If you translate that to English, it would be marked. So that would be a more accented type of articulation an attacked type of articulation now in string articulation we do have what we call harmonic which means to lightly touch the string to create like a light whistly ringing type of sound uh, we barely touch the string and it'll ring like a whistle we also have our left hand pizzicato or our left hand plucking which is that plus sign and you know with a plus sign means to pluck with the left hand, not with the right as we're usually accustomed to as string players. The next marking would be our up bows and down bows. The up bow is a V symbol and the down bow is like a little staple or a square without the bottom part. Those are up bows and down bows for string players. Now with ornamentation, we have a trill, which means to play two notes quickly the note marked and the note above, and you would play them very quickly. Now, another one that a lot of people confuse is a tremolo. Tremolo has three slashes on the beam, and that means to play a particular note very quickly, just repeatedly, as quickly as possible. It's just a repeated note. Now, we also have other notes with slashes, but those slashes, when it's less than three, represent a specific rhythm. So. A note with two slashes is a 16th note. So you would play 16th notes for one beat. For example, also, if you put one slash on a half note, you would play eighth notes for two beats because eighth notes have one beam only or one flag. For repeat signs and repeat markings, a double bar with two dots symbolizes to repeat a specific section if there's no repeat prior to it you just go repeat to the beginning if not you look for the repeat closest to it that's facing in the same direction that's the section or repeat that you would repeat back to now there's a symbol that means to repeat a particular measure those symbols that's a slash with two dots almost like a percentage sign means that you're going to repeat that particular measure that many times for example, let's say I have this measure. The measure after that would be exactly the same as the measure prior. In other words, I would have quarter, quarter, half exactly the same on that measure. It just means to repeat the exact same measure. Now let's go ahead and talk about first and second endings. First and second endings will be under a bracket labeled with a one and a two. Usually there is a repeat sign under that first ending, um, not always, but most of the time. The first ending you will play the first time and then repeat back to either the beginning 
or wherever the other repeat sign is. The first time only. The second time, you'll pretend it's not there, and then you'll jump over to the second ending measure. Again, the first ending is only played the first time. You skip it completely the second time. Now, let's look at how that would actually work in a piece. Let's say we're starting at the beginning. We would play all the way through, and once we get to the first ending, we actually play that first ending box. We would play that measure and repeat. In this case, we would repeat back to the beginning because there's no other repeat sign. We would go back a second time, play all that section again, but this time skip the first ending and jump over to the second ending. Then we would continue on with the piece just like we had been. We would play all the measures and go on through the piece. Now let's say that we got to a section labeled as DC. DC stands for dot capo or beginning, so we go straight back to the very beginning of the piece. Dot capo, two words, D-A-C-A-P-O. Now let's change the C for an S. That stands for dal seño, which means to the symbol. That symbol is like an S with a slash through it, so we would go back to that symbol instead. We would get to that measure and go back to the symbol. Now what if it says DC al fine? Well, we know that DC means da capo, or to go to the beginning. Fine means that we're going to find the word fine. So we go to the beginning and play the music all the way through until we get to the word fine, which is where we stop. Now let's say that we have a coda in this particular piece. So what we're going to do is we're just going to create a really quick coda here at the very end. We're going to bracket off that section just to make it nice and clear. And then we're going to have some words that say... DC Alcoda. So we're going to go ahead and add those in just right before the coda. What does that mean? That means that DC, of course, means to go back to the beginning. So we go all the way back to the beginning. We play through the piece. But this time, what we're going to do is we're going to find the coda symbol. Once we find that coda symbol, we stop there. So we go through the piece until we get to the coda symbol. We stop there and we jump directly to the coda section, not playing anything after the symbol. That is how you play a DC al coda. Thanks for watching. For more music videos or educator tutorial videos, go to my YouTube and subscribe.